Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to this webinar about how to take climate action through the foods you choose, a panel discussion about the future of meat and dairy. My name is Tara De Costa. I'm the Climate Emergency Engagement Officer here at the at Yarra City Council, and I'll be moderating tonight's session. I'd like to start tonight's event by acknowledging the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people as the traditional owners and true sovereigns of the land that we call Yarra. We acknowledge the significant contributions made by other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to the life in Yarra, and we pay our respects to elders of all nations and to their elders past, present and future. So welcome, welcome to tonight's webinar. Uh, at Yarra, <clears throat> we are committed to responding urgently to the challenges of climate damage. Uh, Yarra was one of the first councils to declare a climate emergency, and part of our climate emergency plan is to support individuals and households to take climate action in a number of different ways. We acknowledge that the scale of the problem goes beyond individual actions alone, yet there are still a number of important ways that we can take action in our everyday lives that collectively can make a real difference. And one of those ways is through the foods that we choose. We know that there is a strong link between our diets and climate change, with 13% of our total greenhouse gas emissions nationally coming from animal agriculture every year, making it the fourth highest source of emissions. A vast majority of these emissions are from methane, methane from livestock, meaning that meat and dairy consumption has a much higher footprint than many uh, plant-based alternatives. But methane emissions is only one part of the story about the connection between agriculture and greenhouse gas emissions. Forests are another part of that story. Forests also play a critical role in drawing down carbon from the atmosphere. Land clearing or deforestation is also responsible for about 10% of Australia's total greenhouse gas emissions. Nearly all of this land clearing, particularly in Queensland, is for beef production, and Australia has one of the highest rates of land clearing in the developed world. So, in short, the production and the consumption of beef, lamb and dairy puts a lot of pollution into the air. And knowing this, it begs the question, what is the future of meat and dairy? And that's what we're here to talk about tonight. Uh, last year, Yarra City Council hosted a series of events about how to incorporate more plants and less meat and dairy into our diets. We had a number of really interesting talks and hosted a plant-based cook-along with Shannon Martinez. There are some great videos which are shared on our Take Climate Action website, which I encourage you to check out. Tonight, though, as a follow-on to those events, we're delving into a slightly different part of the conversation. Yes, we are acknowledging that eating more plants and less meat and dairy is an important way to take climate action. But tonight we'll be hearing from scientists who are researching some of the alternatives to traditional meat and dairy production, asking the question of whether it's possible to keep a small amount of meat and dairy in our diet um, that does not have um, such a damaging impact on the planet. It's an interesting question, and I think it's been a really fascinating discussion. So before I introduce you to our first speaker, I just have a couple of housekeeping notes to go through. Uh, the webinar will be recorded, so please do keep your cameras off. To avoid any background noise and disruptions, please keep yourselves on mute. And we will have time for questions um, after we hear more from our panellists about their work, but please put your questions into the Q&A function, not in the chat, but in the Q&A function that's at the bottom of your screen. Okay, so you may have seen from some of our um, promotions for the, tonight's event that the Climate Council was meant to join us um, to give us an overview of the connection between diet, emissions and climate, but unfortunately they were unable to join us at the last minute, so I have to pass on their apologies and ours um, that they couldn't be with us. However, we are super fortunate to be joined by our first speaker, Dr Liza Baba, who is more than qualified to speak on this topic. I should note that Liza has to log off at about 7.30 this evening, so we'll have to allow for questions straight after she speaks. Um, so Dr. Liza is up on our screen now. Hi. Um, Dr. Liza Baba is a public health dietitian working at Monash University where she teaches nutrition and dietetics students about food sustainability systems and planetary health. 
Eliza recently led the development of Dietitians Australia's inaugural position statement on healthy and sustainable diets. And her PhD explored the role of local government policy in promoting a population-wide shift towards more environmentally sustainable diets. Liza, welcome, and thank you so much for being with us, especially on such short notice. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. I'm going to see how we go here. Um, hopefully this will work. Fine. Can you see that? All right, Taryn. Yeah, that's looking good. I think. Excellent. Well, I'm I'm yeah. delighted to be here with you all. Um, are you ready for me to start, Taryn? Please do. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Well, yeah, I'm really happy um, to be here with you talking about such an important topic, something I'm very passionate about. Um, so I'm joining you from the unceded lands of the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, um, and I'd like to pay my respect to elders past and present. Um, and as we talk about sustainability tonight, um, this extends to an incredible respect um, to maintaining a truly sustainable food system here in Australia for over 60,000 years. Um, so just to give um, a little context um, to today, to tonight's um, discussion, I think it's really important to just define um, what the food system is more broadly and why each of us as consumers can play a really important role um, in transforming it. Um, so scholars in the UK have described it as the interconnected system of everything and everybody that influences and is influenced by the activities that bring our food from paddock to plate and beyond. So it's a very holistic, um, very big definition of the food system that I'm talking about with you tonight. Um, so this, it's a really complicated figure. Um, but it's a really great image of our food system. It shows the many inputs, um, outputs, all the different feedback loops um, of food systems. And it highlights um, how each activity within the food system um, can trigger and influence change um, more broadly in the system. Um, so over here, we've got um, us as consumers. Um, we've got the food supply chain here. Up here, we've got um, the governance systems. There's local government with the Yarra Council. Um, so you can see lots of factors that influence the food system. Um, and yeah, although it's it's pretty overwhelming to look at, I do really like um, this image. And I think it's a, an important reminder of just how complex um, the food system is. Um, and a nice reminder that changes that we make within the system will likely affect lots of different people, lots of different natural ecosystems, um, and there'll be unintended and intended consequences um, of any actions that we take within the system. So I'm sure everyone online tonight knows um, that experts are calling for urgent and significant transformation of this current food system. Um, so on the left here, we've got um, some of the pressures that our food system is under. Um, so climate change is affecting the planet's ability to produce food. Um, and then we've got global population growth that's adding pressure to produce more food more efficiently. And then on the right here, um, I guess these pressures on our planet are only worsened. Um, by the fact that the, the feed system is producing these really harmful byproducts. Um, so, for example, 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions, um, which I'll break down a little in the next couple of slides. Um, but sadly, the way that food is um, produced and distributed in our current feed system is also causing malnutrition in all its forms. Um, so the way it's, it is at the moment, our food system is promoting obesity, overweight, diet-related chronic diseases, um, and unfortunately it's people who are already experiencing disadvantage who are um, affected and impacted the most by this. Um, so this um, just shows that the, the byproducts then feed back and catalyse climate change, and so the cycle goes on and on. Um, so this is why there's these resounding calls um, for really urgent and really significant transformative efforts. 
Um, so as mentioned, um, our feed system is responsible for 30% of all global emissions. Um, and you can see here um, where those emissions are coming from within our food system. Um, so at the top here, we've got emissions coming from activities within that food supply chain. Um, next is the largest contributor, which is um, livestock and fisheries. Um, and I know we're going to hear lots more about this um, tonight. Um, but the emissions here are coming from cattle's digestion, so that enteric fermentation. Um, it's also emissions from manure and pasture management um, and then fuel use in fisheries as well. Um, next down we have the, the crop production. And so this includes the production of food for both humans um, and feed for animals. And finally at the bottom here, um, this is all the emissions created from land use. Um, and again, it's for both humans um, and for livestock. Um, but you can see here that the land use for livestock um, supersedes that for human food. Um, what we've got here in this graph is um, graph is a bit of a breakdown of the greenhouse gas emissions produced from some really commonly consumed foods. Um, and it shows where those emissions are coming from according to the various steps in the, um, the food supply chain up here. Um, so for example, we can see that um, for beef herd, um, most emissions are coming from land use change um, and farm activities. Um, but if we look down here at tofu, for example, there's a much larger percentage contribution from the processing stage, that blue part um, of the food supply chain. Um, so of note for tonight's discussion, it's all these meat um, and dairy foods that are the highest contributors um, to emissions. Um, so how does data like this um, help to inform that bold transformative action that we, um, that we really need? Um, well, a, a couple of years ago, the Eat Lancet Commission brought together 37 of the world's leading scientists um, to answer this really, really ambitious, um, really important question. Can we feed a future population of 10 billion people a healthy diet within planetary boundaries? So in a way that won't compromise future generations. Um, and their two-year inquiry ended, um, it was in February of 2019, um, and they concluded again that radical transformation is required. They put forward five essential strategies to achieve that transformation, and the first of those strategies is all about shifting population-level diets. Um, so that's what we're um, talking about um, today. So the Commission um, developed this planetary health diet um, and this is, um, it follows what they um, describe as a flexitarian approach. So it has much less meat, less dairy, um, less eggs than what the average Australian person um, or person in Australia is consuming. Um, and their intention for this diet was um, to act as a, a reference diet. So it's really to support policymakers um, to promote that population-wide shift towards a more flexitarian um, way of eating. Um, so while it's really helpful to think about what food we're actually putting on our plate, it's really important, but we have to also think about that within the context of that broader food system that I showed you earlier. Um, so as part of my PhD, I looked at um, a number of publications from the United Nations um, to understand what actions we can all take um, to promote both health and environmental sustainability while also stimulating and triggering um, positive change within that whole food system. Um, so while the practices or actions that I'm going to show you in a minute sit here within the consumption phase, um, you'll see that if we adopt these practices, they can actually trigger change throughout these other stages of the food supply chain as well. And um, so this is part of an infographic. If you want to see the whole thing, um, there's a QR code there. Um, but the practices um, 
that are here. There's 13 of them and they basically describe um, a desirable way that each of us can interact with our food system. So in terms of the way we source food, prepare, consume, dispose of our food, all the different touch points that we have with the broader food system. Um, so the 13 practices are categorised into where to source our food from, um, what to eat, and then really importantly, how to eat it as well. Um, and so as you all know, that when consumers demand um, and amplify certain activities, they can in fact drive much bigger change. Um, so that transformation is what we're really hoping for. Um, so you can see, for example, if um, en masse as a population, um, we start demanding more seasonally available foods, we start shortening um, food supply chains by getting to know the people um, and connecting with the primary producers of our food and then um, eating foods available locally um, where possible, so for example. And then I'm really looking forward to the next two speakers tonight because I think they're going to give us some really good um, suggestions on how we can address these two of the 13 practices in particular. Um, so selecting food grown using sustainable production practices um, is really important, knowing how our food is produced. Um, and preferencing more sustainable ways of producing our food. Um, and then in terms of what we eat, consuming no more than what's recommended um, from those animal-derived food um, foods. So happy to answer any questions that you might have. Sorry, Liza, I was just getting my camera back on. <laughs> Thank fine. you so much. That was really, really interesting. Um, I might kick off with a question, actually, because I was curious um, if you could tell us more about the, um, you used the concept planetary boundaries and living within them. Can you tell us more about what that what that means and what that actually looks like? Yeah, sure. I'm no, not an expert, but my understanding is that we um, we don't have infinite resources on Earth, so it's about looking at the resources we have um, accessible to us um, and not extending beyond what can be regenerated within um, a certain life cycle. So it's just living within the resources we have, not overusing what we've got. So, um, yeah, land, fresh water, um, lots of those sort of natural resources because once they're gone and um, once we exceed that um sort of time frame of allowing regeneration and it, it's gone and so that's that's where the future generations their ability to eat a healthy diet um will be sort of jeopardized then great yes and i can see that sam has um who's one of our speakers tonight has put a link in around planetary boundaries so thank amazing thanks for that sam um and are you able to tell us a little bit more about the importance of some of these 13 actions? Are some more impactful than others and, and where we should focus our focus our energy or our attention? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sure. So there is a bit of research um, around and certainly the topic that we're talking about tonight, so the um, consuming less or no more than recommended of the animal-derived food is a really important one. And probably um, arguably the most um, kind of higher um, impact item. Um, certainly around agricultural production practices is a really big one. So if we can prioritise more favourable ways of producing food, um, that's going to have a huge impact um, on emissions as well. Um, and then this one is quite a controversial one, but looking at um, reducing our intake of ultra-processed foods um, so that's a really, um, it's a fairly contentious one. Um, when you look at walking into the supermarket, it's just a proliferation of ultra processed foods. All those items in the middle aisles of our supermarket are getting more and more and more. Um, so yeah, I guess encouraging people to shop more from the outside of that supermarket where the foods are um, replenished a bit more frequently 
um, is something that we can all do to, um, yeah, just limit these. They're often overpackaged foods and um, in many ways um, not as nutrient um, dense. So, yeah. Yeah. And I th- and you mentioned earlier about that um, about about the sort of inequities around food and about people living with disadvantage and often some foods can be cheaper when they're highly processed, which seems ludicrous, doesn't it? <laughs> the uh, process it's been through, but absolutely, and the the money behind marketing these ultra processed foods, um, yeah, there's a lot of social injustice um, in in there for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we were going to, I'm not sure if there's any more questions coming through in the chat for you, um, but I did, we did have something, um, oh, sorry, there has been another question from through to pardon me. Um, interestingly, there seems to be a connection between healthy eating and eating that is better for the climate um, processed foods. Do you want us to comment on that? Yeah, it's a really good point. I think it's something that the um, perhaps the nutrition, public health nutrition world, uh, like the environmental lens over the work we're doing is quite new. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's a double win for most things. Like there's, there's very few examples where eating to promote health um, is not also going to benefit the um, environment, which is um, a fabulous that we have that double win. It gives us um, I guess, more leverage in our advocacy efforts. Um, the National Dietary Guidelines are under review at the moment. So, you know, the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating, the plate with the five food groups. So that's all being reviewed at the moment. And um, despite really amazing effort last time, the environmental messages got really pushed aside so we're hoping that this time the environmental messages will be a lot clearer a lot more prominent um because it's yeah it is that double win for health and and the planet thank you and there was another question that's come through in the chat for you um was there anything else that you'd recommend that we can do to have impact beyond the food choices that we personally make it's a broad question but yeah, um, I'd say um, maybe, I mean, you're all here tonight, so getting involved in local government and advocacy efforts and community action and um, being part of that sort of transformation movement. And um, I, I think a lot of people underestimate the power that they have as an individual and the importance of their voice in speaking up about this. So yeah, it's certainly like putting the right foods on our plate and choosing the right, um, the you know, where they've been grown and um, sourcing our food um, responsibly. But, yeah, also just sharing your thoughts and um, and having a, having a loud voice, I would say. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, if there's no more questions coming through on the chat, we had one last thing that we wanted to ask you. Um, and if there were three um, three calls to action, three top things that you would say people could do, um, with that you would recommend that people do to take climate action through their food choices, what would those top three things be? That's good. It's so hard when you've been researching this topic to <laughs> think of just three. Um I'd say a big one for me is putting faces behind our food. So I know that sounds a little strange, but getting to know the people that have been involved in um, either producing your food or transporting your food or selling your food, all those different people in the food supply chain. Um, And I think that if everyone had more appreciation and um, a, a connection to the people involved in our food, there'd be a lot less food waste and we'd probably have a a bit more respect for our food and um, appreciate it and enjoy it and love it a lot more. So, yeah, the the faces behind our food. Um, A second one would be I've got small children, so I think um, for me I love the idea of getting our kids involved and understanding where their food comes from, again, just to appreciate the value and um, how how precious our food is. Um, 
And then, yeah, just little things. I think it's looking at what you're doing already and um, acknowledging and celebrating all the good actions that we're taking now and keeping those going and just thinking about perhaps one or two extra little things we can do. So it's not about all of a sudden I have to do all these 13 things on that slide. It might be, okay, I am going to, this month, I'm going to start a worm farm or I'm going to start shopping more from the outside of the supermarket instead of those middle aisles, or I'm going to visit my local farmer's market. So just probably one or two actions at a time and just slowly, slowly you'll get there. Yeah, that's great advice to not get overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, ask um, about how you talk to your children or teach your kids about, about where their food comes from. Yeah, like we've always um, got veggies growing in the backyard. Um, We would love to have chickens. We don't have chickens at the moment. Um, They've got a chicken coop at school, so I'll talk to them about that. Um, And then just, yeah, getting them in the kitchen and um, chopping up the herbs that they've picked from the garden. And so just um, I think there's something so beautiful and tactile about separating food from nature putting it in the kitchen and allowing them to enjoy it and smell it and um, experience that food. Um, just, yeah, they, they love it. So they don't always eat all the healthy things, but at least I've had a positive experience with it. Yeah, I'm sure some yeah. that filters through to them, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Well, we, um, I think that is the end of the questions that have come through in the chat and we're going to run out of time for our next speakers. So um, thank you so much, Eliza, for giving us such a holistic um, view of that food systems and how meat and dairy fits into that it was really, um, really interesting. And those graphs were um, really, like, really helped to highlight, highlight some of those impacts. So we appreciate that very much. My pleasure. Um, yeah, and I, as I said earlier to everybody, Liza does have to log off at seven thirty. But if you have any more questions for her before then, we can um, we can pop them into the um, Q and A, and hopefully, um, yeah, hopefully she might have time to answer them after we introduce our next speaker. So um, we have the pleasure of introducing to you um, Professor Nicholas Paul, who is a biologist. Hi, Nick, um, a biologist in the School of Science, Technology and Engineering at the University of the Sunshine Coast. Thanks for joining us from Queensland. Um, Nick leads applied research and development on seaweed and algae for new product development based upon a platform of sustainable production. He is the project leader on two international research for development projects focused on domesticating new species creating new culture techniques and developing bioproducts for farmed seaweed in the Indo-Pacific region. His interests in Australia revolve around high-value products, including functional food and nutraceuticals for human health, as well as bioactives for livestock and agriculture. And Nick's come to talk to us tonight about seaweed. <laughs> the and topic climate. that everyone wants to talk about. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us tonight, Nick. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so did you want to tell us some more about your work and the solutions being explored by scientists to reduce the impact of animal agriculture on climate? Absolutely. And I've prepared a few slides to help me uh, stay on, on story. and. <laughs> I'd like to begin uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country where I'm coming from uh, tonight, the Gubby Gubby Cubby Cubby uh, people, and pay respects to elders past, present, and emerging. And also acknowledge the continuing uh, connection to country and the contributions they make to the university uh, here as well. So, Taryn uh, asked me to talk about seaweed and in the context of uh, the ways to actually improve. Um, the impact of animal agriculture on the environment. And it's a pretty diverse story. So I, I thought I could first start by just coming uh, to, to where we are uh, in Australia. And so on the, the Sunshine Coast, obviously everybody from Victoria knows about the Sunshine Coast, very popular uh, destination. Uh, the university sits just behind uh, the coastline uh, and we have a whole lot of study sites um, from a marine science point of view with the work that we do uh, on seaweed, which is about uh, the environmental collections and understanding uh, the fundamental biology, which really gives us a nice foundation for all of these 
interesting applied uh, outcomes. Like all marine scientists, we like to get wet. We have quite a large team, so um, and not just marine uh, scientists. We have a very, very diverse team. We have nutrition and dietitians. Um, we have uh, people working on the social side of, of seaweed and the environmental side, as well as chemists and microbiologists and a whole range of other uh, nerdy uh, science-based uh, teams. But this is the area that we often work at, which is uh, around Moffat Beach, which is at Caloundra. Beautiful uh, place to collect and study seaweed. Sometimes it gets a bit rough. It's also a famous surf break, so we can surf in those times. But most of the time, it's classic sunshine uh, style, which is very pleasant uh, when it comes to uh, having a, a wonderful area to study. And it's really diverse in terms of the seaweeds that are the, off the coast. What I wanted to do and um, introduce uh, some of the work that we do overseas is actually step back and, and talk about seaweed which is fundamentally important for a whole lot of cultures across the Indo-Pacific. And I've had the privilege, as well as my colleagues uh, here at UNESC, to work uh, in these places with our um, collaborators uh, and, and looking at all different aspects of seaweed production. So 35 million tonnes of seaweed is produced every year uh, around the world. And a lot of that uh, comes from Indonesia. And a lot of it is literally just off the coastline uh, in submerged fixed structures We've got people farming uh, different types of seaweeds, uh, one type here and another type uh, here. And these are ones that are used for creating gels. It's like agar and carrageenan that we use for uh, thickeners in food products. Most seaweed in the world at the moment is used for food. It's a slightly different context when we go uh, to our uh, partners uh, in the Pacific Islands and we work in Samoa and Fiji and Kiribati where uh, seaweed is a wild harvest uh, only, although some farming is beginning. Uh, and they are able to go out onto these coral atolls. These are wonderful old uh, fish traps uh, in the islands of Kiribati. Uh, it's Tarawa uh, in the middle of the Pacific where sea grapes can be picked uh, off. So these are these wonderful, um, delicious uh, green seaweeds that burst in your mouth and give a, a really uh, subtle uh, marine flavour and a whole lot of thrill uh, when it comes to bursting. And we have uh, people that are involved now in, in being able to promote the seaweed and we have our nutrition uh, students who are able to go out and interact with uh, often the women's groups that are the most keen to, to do work with seaweed. So seaweed's often women's business uh, in these countries. We get a lot of inspiration uh, from uh, all of the countries that we work in. And just to give you an idea of how versatile seaweed can be, these are a whole lot of different products that are being produced uh, with seaweed as a main ingredient in, in Indonesia. Uh, they sometimes make these uh, fish or seafood balls uh, using the, the thick uh, seaweed that's used to, as a binder. They make seaweed chips, uh, which are fried up uh, directly and some nice uh, seasoning, seaweed noodles, lollies, uh, as well as marmalade. And if you're really game, uh, some seaweed fresh uh, nutritious drinks as well. So we're always getting uh, these, these wonderful types of seaweeds overseas. But the reality is that in Australia, we're a net importer of seaweed. So just like our other seafood, which we import about 60 to 70 percent, um, it's the same or even more so with seaweed, but almost all the seaweed that we tend to have access to uh, in, in the shops is coming from Korea and China in the form of nori and wakami and, and kombu. So one of the things that we're trying to do uh, in the seaweed research group, it's about 30 odd um, staff and students here at the university is try to find uh, some of the seaweeds off the coast that might have um, some unique applications, especially in food, but also in other uh, areas. And that gets a lot of attention. Lots of people are interested in seaweed at the moment, which is fantastic. It's a great time to be a seaweed scientist. Uh, we have golden kelp, uh, which is the dominant seaweed all the way from here on the Sunshine Coast, right down around um, Eastern Australia through Victoria as well. It's a really common one. Uh, there's sea lettuce, uh, which is a famous one uh, in Japan and is consumed as a, a condiment. Uh, and then we have this one over here, which is asparagopsis. Uh, which is now famous uh, for some of the methane reduction um, applications in uh, cows, so which I'll come back to as well. But we have to have a different approach um, to what's going on with our neighbours uh, across the Indo-Pacific. 
we have a really strong uh, program here in nutrition and dietetics, uh, and we've got, had some great uh, experiences with the students uh, being involved, as well as a whole range of celebrity chefs that like to come in and make different types of wonderful uh, seaweed-based products. These are two of the seaweeds that are being incorporated into a fish uh, brew, or, um, broth, I should say. Uh, and we also do some other uh, interesting things on the side. We made the first uh, seaweed beer a couple of years ago, which um, caused a lot of uh, a lot of interest around the country. Let's just say seaweed can be a bit polarising. You either love it or you hate it. Um, but in this case, it, I actually liked it. It was a Goza-style beer with a slightly brine taste, and they did a wonderful story uh, around the farming of the seaweed and being able to use it as a sustainable ingredient. Um, seaweed, funnily enough, can also be uh, maybe slotted in um, for the worm in tequila style products and the like, and it, we can have some some nice uh, novelty uh, cocktails, uh, which people are quite interested in as well. This is probably the main seaweed that I wanted to talk about today, um, which is a red seaweed called asparagopsis. Now, funnily enough, I started working on this when I was a young honours student uh, at the University of New South Wales in, in Sydney 25 years ago. So it's my silver anniversary of working uh, on this seaweed. And uh, in 2012, we got some funding uh, with a whole lot of different collaborators to screen for different types of seaweeds to see about whether adding small amounts, so less than 2%, of the, the feed uh, into uh, for cattle actually reduces um, methane reduction. So, sorry, methane production. So, methane is a really important greenhouse gas. Um, and over 100 years, it's 28 times worse than carbon dioxide, which is why we always talk about um, the methane uh, coming from cows as well as coal seam. Uh, gas uh, and, and other um, aspects has been quite a big problem that if we can arrest some of those uh, emissions, then it's going to have some really important short-term consequences too. That seaweed is really abundant off the coast here of the Sunshine Coast. It's actually one of the reasons why I moved to the university is because it is a hotspot. And we're doing lots of different studies around it just to understand the fundamental um, biology because we don't know much about it, but people are obviously really interested in it in terms of feeding it. This is a, almost a Chiapu style famous uh, Polynesian wave of asparagopsis um, breaking there at Muffet Beach, just to give you an appreciation. Sometimes in nature, there's a lot of it, but most of the time there's not. So being able to farm it, just like all of our uh, food, is really important from the sustainability point of view. People get really excited when we talk about this seaweed. Um, there's around well, almost... Uh, 15,000 species of algae out there, um, but only this one uh, type that is responsible for reducing methane. None of the other ones come even uh, close. It's got a lot of attention from government and companies. This was an ad that uh, grabbed from an ad from the federal government last year, which I looked up and saw a, a cow munching away on some red seaweed, which is um, quite unusual still for me to see that being uh, so in the public face. Our marketing team at the university also get quite excited about the work that we're doing on the, the fundamental biology and promote it. And for a brief, great three weeks uh, earlier this year, we even had a billboard uh, which had seaweed uh, up on uh, the road here, the Pacific Highway. So you know that seaweed's hot when it's um, a, a billboard happening. One of the, the things you're probably starting to see now is that there are a number of companies that are uh, looking at promoting uh, the work that, we're, that they're doing in terms of um, growing the seaweed and incorporating it into uh, products and going out in a research sense still in a controlled way, um, for, but to market uh, in a retail setting. Uh, Grilled uh, just came up with the world's most sustainable beef burger using some of the seaweed that's been grown in Tasmania. A Swedish company had the world's first um, beef um, produced um, uh, with low methane methods. Uh, a dairy farm, uh, which is uh, ice creamery in the US, the first ever red seaweed supplement to reduce emissions, and um, another uh, effort by Sea Forest, who are based in Tasmania, worked with MJ Bale on fashion. They had the world first carbon neutral wool. So you can see a lot of the marketing here, world first, world most uh, sustainable. These things are, are really um, out there in terms of um, getting uh, the products uh, to the consumers to try and understand um, will they pay extra for it? Will um, people actually uh, purchase these products uh, as well? Because all of this is really important for making it an, an industry because at the moment there's still a tiny, tiny amount of seaweed being produced 
And certainly in Australia, just to put it in perspective, I mentioned 35 million tonnes produced around the world each year. Uh, last year, we produced around 3,000 tonnes, um, so, and not of this particular species. So one of the things I really wanted to leave you here in the next couple of slides is sort of this notion of coming for the cows, but staying for the, the seafood. And the reality is that any amazing innovation that we have uh, in the science space, there's a whole bunch of people waiting to disrupt that uh, behind you. So there's already companies that are, have identified, uh, well, that we know it is a, a single compound that's responsible. It's got a simple compound that's in the seaweed. You're able to synthesize it and put it into uh, a new product that might actually replace the seaweed. Um, we had a funny instance where they were filming this uh, Hollywood movie, Ticket to Paradise, uh, up in an area that we work uh, in the Whit Sundays, um, where th they were farming seaweed, Balinese uh, seaweed off the coast. Uh, and so Julia uh, Roberts and George Clooney getting involved in seaweed farming always uh, an interesting thing as well. So I, I like it because of the unexpected uh, disruption. So one of the things we're really interested to do to make sure that this isn't just a flash in the pan is to work out what else is that seaweed good for? And at the university, we've actually now shown that using that same seaweed and when we feed it to fish and to prawns uh, at a, a similar, very small dose, it actually boosts their immune system. So disease in aquaculture, when, whenever you're farming anything intensively, uh, is really important. We know that when we extract some of the goodies from inside the seaweed and put it into that feed at a really even smaller dose, it makes them grow faster. And so productivity in terms of how much are we able to produce in a given area uh, is really important from an emissions point of view. And that's what I wanted to show you here is that even if we're talking about um, ruminants, so these are beef, uh, so cattle and dairy and sheep uh, and goats, anything that ruminates and releases methane as part of their normal digestive process, um, they do have a big impact on, on the environment. But we've actually got some pretty um, important goals. Uh, the Australian red meat industry has a goal of being carbon neutral by 2030 and feed additives is such an important part of that. Just to highlight, um, and there's a whole lot of really good data that you can access uh, our world in data, and they split it up in all different types of ways. But these are the total amount of greenhouse gas, gas emissions per kilo of food product uh, on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, there's a whole lot of different products. So beef is at the top. And most of, uh, well, a lot of the emissions that are coming from it are uh, uh, normal uh, greenhouse gas emissions, CO2, for all the production and light, but a significant chunk is from um, methane. Interestingly, prawns are right up there. So one of the ways that uh, farmers grow prawns is the, uh, with a lot of water movement in ponds, and so aerating, keeping them are all alive, and it's actually quite um, poor when it comes to carbon emissions as well. But it's not about methane, the grey bar, it's all about the farming, the production side. Seaweed is not on this list, but if it would be, it would be either just positive or probably even negative because of the wonderful things that seaweed does, and as all plants, in terms of pulling out um, carbon dioxide uh, from the water and essentially from the atmosphere when we're talking about seaweed growing in the surface. I think Lisa touched on this as well before, and one of the things that I often hear, and it's quite important to, to highlight, is that it's mostly about the farm production uh, and land clearing when it comes to grazing cattle. The actual logistics, so the transport side, are highlighted here for prawns and for beef, is very small. Um, so that, that idea of sort of food miles is really sort of gone now. Um, and so the ability of being able to work on those key parts um, to try and come up with new technology or new approaches uh, is really important. So on that, what are these new approaches? We've got to start being more circular. Circular in the sense that there's no such thing as waste. It's just a resource or input for another um, value generating activity and hopefully, of course, environmentally uh, beneficial activity. Uh, one of the things that I've talked about in terms of prawns and cows, both of them being perhaps not so good for the environment at the moment, uh, is that seaweed might actually be this great way to bring them together. So this is what a prawn farm looks like. These are all individual prawn uh, farms with a lot of uh, paddle wheels here that you can see little tails. And that's what is driving all the energy um, production that's being used to make uh, prawns. This is the same around the world, whether it's prawn or shrimp in Southeast Asia. These are a whole lot of ponds, uh, around about 12 hectares worth where seaweed is being grown uh, in the nutrient rich water to strip out those nutrients. Uh, and basically at the moment, 
it's not the asparagopsis seaweed that's being grown there, it's other seaweeds. So can we actually bring um, these two things together? So can we start growing uh, seaweeds, and especially the ones that are good for reducing methane, uh, in our prawn farms? There's a lot of prawn aquaculture in Northern Australia, and there's a lot of potential uh, for it as well. And as I said, we're actually a um, majority seafood importer, so we need to do better in that regard. So being able to grow and reduce our reliance uh, on imported seaweed is really important. And with that culture will come hopefully a whole lot of more opportunities for Australian consumers. So once we start having more seaweed being produced and an industry around uh, seaweed, then we should be able to get more food uh, and other products from seaweed as well. And we might be able to have some nori. So my whole goal now is to, to try and uh, get a, an Australian nori uh, set up where we can convert our, our nice um, seaweed uh, across into uh, nori sheets and things that my family like to eat as well. So next steps, eat more seaweed, grow more seaweed and share more about seaweed. Uh, one of the great things about how everyone's so excited about seaweed at the moment is that it's coming from all different angles. Uh, we're often invited to events where we're talking with artists uh, and uh, musicians about seaweed. Um, people are making different types of exhibitions and we're getting lots of traction now. So being able to capitalise on that is um, a really exciting uh, part to be involved with. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. It's so, so exciting to see seaweed being used in so many different ways. Who knew? Who knew, exactly. <laughs> I've been doing it for 25 years and I still get surprised. It's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. That's fascinating. Um, we've got a few questions coming up, but we might pass over to Sam and then we can do some Q&A together if that's okay. Um, so I will introduce you to our next speaker, Samuel Wines. Sam is a Melbourne-based scientist, a business owner and a social entrepreneur exploring pathways towards a future society where we can meet the needs of humans whilst respecting our planetary boundaries. Informed by nature's principles, he works to weave biological, ecological and systemic insights together to support sustainable and regenerative design, development and innovation. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Sam. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about the exciting things happening in your lab? Yeah, of course. I'll I'll do my best to keep it on on track with everything that's happening here. Um, so just following on from um, I guess the other speakers as well. Just like to pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the original traditional custodians. Uh, innovators and scientists of the land on which we have uh, co-labs up here in Brunswick and pay my respects to yeah, elders past, present and emerging and to any of any, if there's any Indigenous people with us here today, passing on that respect as well. Um, so yeah, uh, what's going on in the lab? There is a lot uh, going on in the lab at the moment. So um, I guess, yeah, by offering space to support impact-oriented innovation, we get a whole raft of people coming in working on projects so um you know whether it's looking at finding ways to remove airborne pathogens so that, you know think covid or whether it's looking at making uh lab grown leather or finding ways to use agricultural waste to then create new biomaterials we kind of have it all happening here at the moment which is really exciting so anything that kind of supports bringing us within the planetary boundaries as taryn mentioned or raises social foundations as well so we have a bit of a transdisciplinary approach to how we how we work bringing in you know the science the design the business the storytelling and weaving it all together to try and help catalyze that transition to a circular bio-based and regenerative economy um, so in terms of some things that are happening in the lab, uh, it's really exciting, actually. We have uh, two companies working on cultivated meat. So VOW um, is uh, one of Australia's sort of, and actually I think they have the largest uh, cultivated meat factory in the Southern Hemisphere up in Sydney. But we also have a space here for them in uh, in CoLabs down here in Melbourne for them to be able to tap into the, the local talent. So they are working on making essentially a new category of food um, from the ground up, essentially. So what they do um, is they take uh, a sample from an organism uh, and then they use cell culturing techniques to then be able to produce that en masse uh, I'll go through the process in a little bit, but I'll just sort of speak through some of the companies that are here first. Um, 
so we also have Magic Valley, who is another um, cultivated meat startup who are working on, um, so, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention, Bow's Doing Quail um, is one of their first products that are coming out. I, I, it's called Morsel. Um, and then Magic Valley is working on cultivated lamb and cultivated pork. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, and then as well, kelp is so hot right now. That is very true. We actually have... Um, Two startups who are working in the lab right now on, uh, yeah, on kelp-related projects. Or I actually, kelp. One's kelp, and then one is um, asparagopsis. So I think uh, one's one's seaweed and one's kelp. Um, and the got that'll be so that'll be uh, Australia's first golden kelp farm in Disaster Bay. So we're helping them. Essentially, we have like what we call a kelp IVF clinic, um, where we're essentially looking at growing and um, germinating kelp uh, they're called gametophytes and we build up enough biomass and then um, what's happening is it's going to go and be seeded on ropes which are put out into the ocean to draw down um, like all the ocean carbon and that then goes into the biomass and then you can bring that onto land and we can use it for for food we could use it for fabric we could look at making algae based plastics or replacements for plastics um, so there's obviously so many amazing things that can happen with seaweed and um, seaweed grows at a rate that much faster than um, terrestrial forests as well. So it's actually a really good carbon sink and way that we can sort of, sort of bring that excess carbon out of the ocean. Um, so most of the carbon that we emit into the atmosphere actually gets absorbed by the ocean. Um, so hence why things like kelp are a really interesting way in which we can sort of mitigate some of that. Uh, Immersion Group is another kelp, car, uh, kelp company that's jumped into the lab gosh, last week. Um, so they are looking at growing asparagopsis in Port Phillip Bay and off the western coast of Australia. Uh, and again, they're using that to feed to livestock to remove and reduce methane emissions. Um, we also have, uh, as part of our business model, we're, we're a social enterprise. So we actively support students and other people with uh, projects in the lab. So we also have uh, a whole bunch of university students coming in and um, doing stuff as well uh, in an alternative protein. Um, so the process of cultivated meat and dairy, I should say, as well. Um, so um, they are different. So I'll, I'll try and be nice and quick and get through it all. But the process of cultivated meat, you take a sample from uh, an animal. Um, and, you know, this might have traditionally been like a biopsy. Um, so sort of going like that and taking a little bit of a uh, bit of muscle out of the organism but um, there are actually now some non-invasive methods where you can kind of scratch the ear um, and then cultivate cells from that so then what happens is the scientists bring it to the lab and they selectively choose a combination of cells that they need to be able to pick for like you know the ideal flavor and texture and aromas that we would sort of want for meat then what they do is they add um, the essential micronutrients that are tailored towards uh, providing high nutritional value, uh, purity and consistency. And then they place that into a bioreactor, kind of like how we brew beer. Um, you can kind of think of it as a really kind of big metal space age looking thing, super cool. Um, and, you know, they put it in there and then they cultivate it. Um, and that's called a, a bioreactor, which is a, it's like a climate controlled environment, which creates the perfect conditions for the, the growth um, of biomass through, I mean, the normal way in which biomass would grow and you have tissue formation. Um, after that has hit a point where they're like, yep, that's perfect. That's all we need. Um, sort of they take that out and then they process it and turn it into food products. Um, so it's not going to be like, uh, you know, a Wagyu beef or a steak. It doesn't come out like that. Um, you know, it's so these things can't necessarily be seen as like a drop in um, replacement. Um, they are a little bit different. Um, and then fermentation of milk. So fermentation of milk is a little bit different. So what we actually do is we get the um, we get the genes that code for milk. Uh, we place that into a yeast and then cultivate that in a bioreactor instead. So actually using uh, one organism to create um, the milk proteins. And then again, you can sort of tailor that to be able to have the right content nutritionally. Um, so pretty cool. It's kind of like designing food um, in a like a precision sort of way, which is really exciting. Um, and I guess some of the some of the benefits to this are that it um, uh, there might be so so the Good Food Institute's put out a study showing that there's around about a 96% reduction in um, emissions related to the production of food if we do explore going down this route. Um, 
which is really interesting. And obviously I'll have to caveat that and say, you know, that really depends if we also decarbonize the energy system, which um, sort of what Eliza was mentioning before, you know, uh, this is a complex interrelated network and web of different systems. So energy being one really key thing that we also have to be keeping an eye on, finding ways to be able to do more uh, green energy. Um, it also uh, results in lower land use. So, I mean, up to 99% less land because you're growing it in a vat rather than growing it on a big open pasture. Um, so less deforestation, which we are talking about before, is a, one of the leading causes of um, emissions in Australia. Um, also reduced water use, uh, which is a pretty big one as well. So about up to 90% of the water we currently use for traditional agriculture. Uh, decreased use of antibiotics. So no need for any of that because you're growing in a controlled environment, um, which is pretty cool. Then uh, another really interesting one, which... Um, sometimes gets left out of the conversation is actually reduced food waste. So rather than, you know, having to grow it on a farm with those big feedback loops in terms of like, you have to grow a cow and then you have to wait and then you, you know, slaughter it. And then all of that, you can actually just kind of do this on demand to meet demands based on how much, you know, your uh, people need or demand in a certain time. So um, it's actually really interesting um, in that regard. It can reduce the supply chain length because you don't have to have as many steps. And each of those steps, there is a potential for waste. Um, and you could also look at using and feeding the organism's plant biomass um, to feed, like sort of feed the cells, which is agricultural waste. Again, one organism's waste is another organism's food, bringing it back to one of those principles of life that um, Nicholas so kindly called out for us earlier on. Um, so yeah, there's some really interesting ways to reduce waste. Uh, and then in terms of food security, uh, I kind of tapped on that a little bit before, but yeah, increased, increased efficiency when it comes to um, the traditional agricultural method of making food, like we're going to have a hundred percent increase in, uh, you know, the need for protein in the next, by the, by 2050, uh, we don't have enough land or resources to make that happen. So uh, by using cultivated meat or precision fermentation for dairy, um, that could kind of help us really increase our efficiency. Um, obviously, it's going to be also a more sustainable uh, protein source. And then there's also the ethical implications of we don't have to slaughter anything and we don't have to keep something to milk it. Um, you know, these things are sentient uh, living organisms with a uh, transient sense of self. And then some of them actually might even have some form of self-reflexive consciousness where they there is what is something like it's like to be that animal. So, you know, thinking about how many of those are in captivity is pretty crazy. Um, I'm going to cut it a little bit short just because I'm noticing we're dragging off into some of the time for Q&A. Um, but yeah, there obviously uh, there has been um, evidence that there is a reduction of methane emissions, as we sort of called before by doing this sort of process. So it would be around about 96%, um, which is pretty cool. But as I said before as well, um, we still, this is a really new area, so I'm not trying to act like it's a panacea for everything. Um, and we really need to sort um, sort out our like our energy use when it comes to this sort of thing. And also just eat less meat uh, in general, um, sort of bringing it back to what Liza said before. Um, we have a couple of papers and things. If it's of interest and you'd like to know a little bit more after the fact, I can share, sort of we'll share with you a couple of white papers speaking to cultivated meat. Um, which will hopefully provide uh, some further insights for you to, to sink your teeth into. Um, thanks so much, Taryn, as well. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. That's um, that's so fascinating, and I feel like like completely changes like the landscape of so many different things. And um, I really yeah, that interconnectedness that you talk about is so. Um, Yes, and it's very true. It's really mind-boggling, actually, to think about how different things could be. Um, we have heaps of questions coming through to the chat for, for you and for Nick, so I'm just going to hop right to it, if that's okay. Um, Nick, there's some questions that have come for you, um, through for you. Um, one of them is around access, and um, is there somewhere that people can find information on which companies are using beef from cows that are fed this seaweed? Um, and are there any other places to find this beef other than the, the ones that you mentioned earlier? The, those ones are, are really hot off the press. They're, they're happening at the moment. So it's important to understand that we're right back at ground zero still, um, because while we've found this amazing result in terms of the understanding that when you put 
put the seaweed into a diet, it reduces the methane. That's now been tested uh, in beef and dairy around the world. It's still early days and there's no commercial supply as in regular commercial supply. And that's what everybody is actually doing. There's a, um, yeah, there, there is now a, a group of uh, companies that are starting to, to farm uh, asparagopsis, but there's a long lag time for starting up something new. And Sam alluded to this too. It's, it is really at that startup level. Um, some of them are well-resourced and might move quickly, uh, but it won't be uh, anytime soon that it'll be a regular um, feature in the supermarket. But what they're getting is important information. A lot of the times in sustainability, especially when we talk to consumers, people say, oh, yes, we would pay more for uh, carbon neutral or um, climate friendly. But when it comes to, you, you talk to business researchers and consumer researchers, when it actually comes to paying at the cash register, they often don't make those choices that they might aspire to in other times. Uh, so bear, bearing that in mind, um, the, there are yeah, quite a few uh, companies in Australia uh, farming, uh, looking to farm the seaweed, mostly down south. We're really interested in uh, access for northern Australia because of that compatibility with existing uh, agriculture and aquaculture uh, that's in the north. And that's quite a, a good fit, really, in terms of tropical um, production. Right, so it grows better up north, exactly. Isn't faster. It? Yeah, things faster. grow faster in the tropics, think, as yeah. everyone probably knows. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, like whenever I've been up north, everything's so lush and green and growing beautifully and the seaweed is the same apparently. There you go. <laughs> it just, well, it definitely grows faster. So the, the, yeah. that's quite, so I guess, a little bit of a juxtaposition is that when you go into the water in Melbourne or in Tasmania, you see a lot of seaweed. But that's like seeing a really old rainforest that is wonderful and full of biomass but isn't actually growing that quickly. So the, the, the tropical rainforests, of course, grow quickly and all the, um, the tropical reefs, high turnover. And so there's some of the, that's one of the reasons why Indonesia's uh, the second largest producer of seaweed in the world sitting smack on the equator. Okay, interesting. Great. Um, on that kelp question, Sam, there was a kelp question for you. Um, so are the kelps that you mentioned, the ones removing carbon from the oceans to make algae based plastics, um, and I think there might have been a couple of others that you mentioned, are those technologies that are possible now? Uh, I guess just to reiterate what Nicholas said, um, like the future is here, but it's just not evenly distributed or scaled up. Um, so there are, I, like, for example, um, people can look up algae knit and people can look up ulu which are two startups working on algae based so the, the the former is doing algae based yarn the latter is looking at doing plastics here in australia um and then as i said you know we have the kelp companies that are coming in here and doing their research so immersion group and ellis kelp um and we already have startups here in the space going oh let me know when your kelp farm's up and running because we'd love to use that as an input to our biomaterials and they're like, yeah, great. We will let you know in about a year and a half. Because uh, again, as Nicholas was saying, to, to do these things at scale, like it's one thing to test it, um, you know, by the bench, you know, ordering something in and making it happen. But it's a whole other ball game when you have to try and scale that up and make it work. Um, so yeah, these things are coming soon, but they're not necessarily readily available yet. And it's just like everything. Like use Lycra as an example. That took, the, like, I think it took DuPont like, 30 or 40 years to get that to a point at which you could just make a crap ton of Lululemon pants, you know, before then it wasn't, it wasn't around and it cost them a lot of money to make it happen. And now you can get a pair of pants for like 10 bucks. So keeping those sort of things in mind and, you know, the only, the only way we'll be able to bring that cost down is, is if the, you know, the government and there was some regulations to be able to support or, or fund this sort of stuff and tax things that are a bit more, um, I guess say resource intensive, but that's another conversation. Yes. And maybe you could put the names of those companies in the chat, the ones that you just mentioned, so some people were interested. Yeah. Um, Nick, another question for you. Um, can any other animals eat this seaweed and will it reduce methane from any other animals? Um, you mentioned wool. Do other do other animals cause methane like cows? Is the question. Yes, no, not as much as cattle. So there are lots of different types of ruminants. So ruminants are, and from a cattle point of view, beef and, and dairy cows have 
four stomachs and the other smaller ruminants have a smaller number of stomachs like goats and um, remember I'm not an animal scientist but goats and, and sheep uh, uh, and yeah look, um, those and it works on them as well so some of the original studies were done on sheep um, just because they're smaller and easier to um, access it's like Sam was saying sometimes it's about how much you can get in order to do the right study so yeah we'll work on all uh, ruminants in terms of reducing uh, methane emissions cattle's a big one one and a half billion cattle around the world we have 25 million it's always an estimate because we never really know how many are in the northern herd grazing out there um, we have 25 million in Australia so it puts it into perspective as well the scale of how much seaweed um, to be able to work with all these um, different countries. And the, the scale is actually just unrealistic when you think about how much of the ocean area would need to be um, farmed and where is that going to be and all of these environmental issues and Sam touched on ethical ones. They're all really important discussions. Um, and I think in Australia, um, Liza said this about um, eating the amount that you need to eat uh, for the different food groups, really important. Um, Different cultures have really different approaches to us, though, and being able to service some of those uh, areas where beef is just going to stay on the menu for a long time is also uh, quite important. Yeah, there was another follow-up question around ethics, actually, for you, Nick. So isn't the risk of seaweed to reduce ruminant methane emissions um, that it simply enables a set of practices that obviously have to diminish to protect the health of humans and the health of the planet? Did you want to comment on that? It's, it's a really important question. We, we think about this as well. Um, and look, the, there's so many different elements to that. Um, the land clearing that happens uh, to uh, grazing beef is a huge factor uh, in that um, graph that I showed. Land clearing is a really important contributor to climate change. So not doing or limiting the amount of new area that's cleared, really important. Um, and then the existing production areas, if they're not going to stop, then how do we do uh, better across all those elements, not just for the feed additives, but the supply chain uh, as well. And I, I guess consumers making the choice that makes the most sense to them um, is, is really important. And you know, I think it's, a, it's an everything problem, like we've, as in we've got to throw the whole toolbox at it. Sam touched on, um, we didn't say it, I'm going to say it unelegantly, fake meat. Um, so, and but these are all things that we just have to be, be doing um, to service 10 billion people by 2050. So it's not as though we've stopped. Um, so I think, yeah, we need to more plant-based. I mean, you obviously saw, I, I said, eat more seaweed, go straight to the source. Uh, it's just that it's quite hard to get all the protein out of seaweed. So um, the carbohydrates, which are the gels, get in the way of us digesting them, but we get wonderful flavours and taste still about it. Maybe we need more kimchi than at least it's broken down for us. Huh. Just, to, just to rip off that, um, Nick, I think um, it's really important to, uh, and this, I'll ask this question, great question. Um, it's really important to acknowledge that uh, there's a really fun framework called the Three Horizons Framework when it comes to innovation. And it's acknowledging that, you know, Horizon 1 is business as usual. Horizon 3 is, you know, the vision that we have for the future. And then Horizon 2 is the bridge that gets us there. So a quick example would be, you know, um, let's just say uh, mountaintop removal and fracking to get more oil, very much Horizon 1. Um, green, you know, green hydrogen using solar, very much Horizon 3. And then Horizon 2 would be using electrification of cars to kind of get us there which will eventually become a horizon one because we don't have enough rare earth minerals so it's it's worth thinking about this as well in that um feeding cows asparagopsis is really useful and that's a way like a horizon two solution as we sort of work towards more things like cultivated meat or finding more lower impact ways to produce food whether that's uh polyculture or whether that's working on permaculture or urban farming there is so many ways and you know yes i only spoke about a couple here but i just yeah it's worth acknowledging that um even though i work for a, a an innovation company i don't think tech is going to be what's going to save us all the time and we shouldn't always try and hope for techno optimism there is a real need for things like regenerative agriculture um and you know even growing food and vegetables at home or herbs at home or whatever you can kind of do in that in that way i, I think is a really important thing to to keep in mind but yeah that the, the, it's it's less bad is a really good way of thinking about it. So if we can feed them 
seaweed, it's less bad than what would already be happening anyway. And it's not going to stop, as Nick said, like we're not going to be able to scale up cultivated meat to the level at which it supersedes and replaces all agriculture. That's just not going to happen, especially not within the next 50 years. We have we have to have 200 percent the amount of protein we have now by 2050. You know, uh, I so it's just keeping that in mind. It's like a we get it's a food system, not not from a single source. And all we're doing is going to be adding to that, and hopefully, progressively reducing the demand on on um, land based agriculture as time goes on. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, I think that um, like Liza's really hectic <laughs> diagram that she showed earlier is a really good. Um, yeah, I mean, it really just sort of sums up that it's such a complicated system and it's a very multi-pronged and, yeah, it's it's going to take lots of time and lots of different approaches. Um, there was a very practical question that was asked of you, Sam, actually about um, cultivated meat and can it be started out of cells from other cultivated meat or does it need to be started from new animal cells? Do you know? Yeah, so um, they do a thing... Which uh, I mean, this this set up a uh, this was a trigger warning when someone said it another time at a different event that I was hosting. Uh, it's called uh, immortalized cell lines. That doesn't mean cancer. That just means that they play with um, the way in which a cell grows, and it will just keep keep dividing. But you obviously need to give it all the nutrients and everything to keep going. Um, and then they can also put them on ice or like what we would say like cryo and be able to store them and then go back to that and then keep using it, um, you know, ad infinitum. Um, kind of like how we have things like they're called HALA cells um, where, you know, you, you can get these um, and, you know, you can take one sample and then just keep replicating it, right? After a while, inevitably, you will need to get another sample. Um, but the beauty of that is that you could then go and find samples of prize prize winning, you know, um, beef from a certain farm in a niche place in um japan where they grow all the best wagyu beef in the world and get a set like so to begin with you just kind of they just go and get a sample but then as time goes on we can look at actually diversifying out into selective breeds or um you know moving on to things like prawn and everything like that but um in short no you don't need to get a sample every single time you can keep um if if the if you have this to sell stem cells as pluripotent stem cells um you're kind of reverting them back to like level one of being a cell and they can kind of keep growing from there and differentiating out um, just depends on the environment that you keep them in interesting and nick i've got another very practical question for you too um what are the practicalities of how to get cattle or livestock to consume a handful of seaweed per day that's a really uh, good point um, at the moment the most immediate pathway to do that is when they're in a feeding situation. So whether that's in dairy, when they come in to, to feed a couple of uh, in feedlot situations or um, from a beef point of view, when they are in feedlot at the end, um, so with it before the turning off. So that's the, mo the most straightforward way because it's only a really small amount that needs to be um, mixed in with other feed uh, as well. So we're talking about uh, 50 grams out of 200, uh, sorry, uh, 20 kilos worth of um, feed that a, a cow would eat in that setting. There's a lot of research happening at the moment to try and make the seaweed or the form that it can be turned into stable so that it can be used in more of the range grazing settings. Um, which then makes it more accessible um, to more of the well, to the other 90% 90, 90 of the cattle in Australia. But if you think, practically speaking, um, it's going to be enough of a challenge to get to serving the 10% of the cattle that are in relatively easy to feed situations, let alone the other 90% for now. So, Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and Sam, I've got another question for you from Bella. Um, what are the inputs that you need to cultivated meat dairy um, for cultivated meat dairy to grow biomass and do these have environmental consequences? Uh, I think 
Absolutely is the answer. Um, the like the Earth, for all intents and purposes, is a closed system aside from the solar income that's constantly coming in, um, which means that um, everything in here is just constantly shifting and changing, um, you know, energy and mass. So uh, whenever you're taking something to make something else, it has to come from somewhere. Um, so yes, there is, and there's always going to be an environmental impact, even for the most sustainable things um so i think yeah it's we can't we don't really have the full lcas yet i shared a scientific article actually um with you taryn we can sh share later but we haven't been able to do enough research into this to know what all the costs and everything are so one of the major issues and one of the major hurdles has been um that uh prior to i guess these companies are looking at scaling things up uh, the media that they used was FBS, which is fetal bovine serum, uh, which kind of goes totally against the whole principle of uh, using uh, cultivating meat because you're having to get serum from the fetus of a cow. Um, so there's been a lot of workarounds of that recently to try and change that and work with more sustainable solutions and ways of making things happen. Um, and then same goes like all of the tailored nutrition that we're looking at getting, as I mentioned before, um, we can look at trying to get that from food waste, which has already, you know, gone past the use by date for, let's say humans, we could still potentially look at finding ways to utilize that to be as a feedstock for these micro, uh, for like for the microorganisms for like the yeast or what have you, or, um, even feeding it to the cells. Um, it's that whole one organism's waste, it's another organism's food. So we can always try and make that happen. Um, but yeah, I'd be lying if I said there's no environmental impact, like look at all the metal and everything that has to be put into making anything. But it's one of those things that we kind of hope that initially, and it's like everything in life, um, during the growth phase is when every organism uses the most resources and all it does is take, take, take. And then once it, once I think of a tree or a sapling, once it reaches maturity and becomes a mother tree, all it does is give back and give food and nutrients to its little saplings that come around. And, and so it's kind of thinking about that when it comes to organizations is they all have these growth cycles. And after they hopefully grow to a level at which they can reach scale, hopefully then um, they can start looking at reducing the impact they have on the environment and do things in a more sustainable manner. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Um, yeah, I hope so too. That was from Bella. I think it did. Um, and Gwyneth also wanted to ask you, Sam, um, what sort of shelf life do these foods have um, and how are they stored? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so still the verdict is out on all of this because we still have to make the thing to be able to then, you know, put it in packaging and see. But the premise is that... Um, due to the sterile environment that we're working in and due to the fact that um, you can literally choose and tailor what you put in it, um, if you store it straight from in the lab, there could be a chance that it actually has a longer shelf life uh, than traditional meats um, because it's just way less contamination. And, and so that's a, like a really interesting, um, I guess, thread that hasn't been fully researched yet, but we have a pretty good inkling that it will kind of... Uh, I guess, be able to last for longer. Um, and then, yeah, I think the, like the shelf life as well, like, cause it might not be a steak, right. It might be um, like, uh, there's still going to have to be some form of processing that goes on to be able to turn this into uh, a food product. Right. So I know that before we were speaking to the fact that we want to reduce our consumption of processed foods, but, uh, but then also, you know, remembering that tofu is processed. So it's, it's always a bit of a gray area, right? These might be more processed foods, but they might actually be more nutritionally dense because we've optimized it for, uh, you know, human consumption. But um, yeah, I think it should be able to provide a bit of a longer shelf life, uh, but we don't know. And that's the beauty of science is we always have to try and figure these things out and see if we can make it happen. Uh, but yeah. Great. Thank you, Sam. I, we're getting towards the end of our questions um, and towards the end of our time for questions. But um, Nick, there was one last question for you. And what is your favourite seaweed food? I can't go past Roy sheets, to be honest. They're just so versatile. We love them, um, poke bowls, but also having a bit of a snack. And we have Australian species of nori that we haven't managed to work on on close the life cycle yet. So as I, I think I 
my my video, which was really cute uh, TikTok style video, didn't play at the end. But basically, if we can turn uh, some of our or get some of our uh, Australian Nori into culture, it's only there sporadically, but I know when it is, then I think that'd be a huge thing for us because that's most people's experience with seaweed at the moment. And it's so versatile. You can put so many different flavours on it. So I love it. Yeah, that's true. That's the only thing that I can think of. Um, although you did mention agar and I was like, oh, I didn't realise that was made of seaweed. There you go. Yes. And I mean, sea grapes um, in different countries in the Pacific Islands and Indonesia, they are delicious though. Um, but they're something that's you need to have fresh, so it has to be in the fresh seafood market. But um, that's a wonderful little popping pearls in your mouth um, and you have them with shredded or coconut and lime juice and some chili and things and it's delicious too. So there you go. No, I'm going to keep saying more and more so I should stop. I'll just stop. <laughs> no, that's great. We're very passionate about the seaweed. We appreciate it. <laughs> um, and I just had a comment for you, Sam, um, from Roots. She said, thank you for bringing the important question, um, quite the important question of animal ethics to the into the conversation as well, which you mentioned earlier. Thank you. Um, so to wrap up, I would really love to hear from both of you about what your um or to reiterate what some of your top three things are, the top three actions that people can take to take climate action through their food choices. Um, I think you've already sort of touched on it, Nick, but did you want to say it again? What was it that I think I tried to sum it up nicely, that we should <laughs> more seaweed, <laughs> should grow more seaweed and we should talk more seaweed. So there we go. All three of those. Triple bottom line of seaweed. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Oh, I love that. Um, yeah, I think, uh, look, it's going to sound like a bit of a broken record because they've kind of spoken about before, but um, yeah, definitely reducing meat consumption um, or just anything that is quite labor intensive it doesn't have to just be meat um you know we can see those graphs and see that there are other forms of food which are probably quite resource intensive so just being i guess aware of that is a really important first step um buying local and seasonal produce find a find a co-op like here in melbourne um organic ease i can get a delivery of organic fruit and vegetables direct from the farmers to them and then i can get that delivered to my door for like 59 dollars, or go to your local melbourne farmers market or something like that and just find some like good organic biodynamic produce uh, or just support your local veggie store that's not bloody coles or woolworths um no offense if there's any people from coles or woolworths on the call but i don't think there is so that's okay um but yeah there are ways in which you can um support your local uh, i guess is a really important thing uh, I mean, and as I sort of called it out before, but reducing food waste. So just making sure you actually eat the damn things you buy. Um, and my personal favorite, um, you get a fourth one and a bonus one, um, would be start your own herb or veggie garden. Um, so much cheaper. And then none of those stupid little plastic containers. And then you can also just make really tasty, delicious food. And it all has all like amazing micronutrients in there. And, you know, maybe you get yourself a little like a fish bowl and grow your own kelp in there as well maybe we can have a chat with nicholas and see if we can do an at-home diy kelp growing kit for nori sheets um <laughs> i got time for that no food miles exactly that <laughs> thank you thanks so much to both of you um i really appreciate the variety of different voices that we've heard in tonight's conversation it's been really really interesting i think that I think that our diets and our food choices, they can be very emotional and, um, you know, like it was mentioned earlier, they're tied up with our culture and with our childhood memories and all of these things. So it can be make, you know, making dietary choices or making changes to our diet, I think can be really, really hard. Um, but I also think because we make decisions about our food, you know, all day, every day, it can also be a really great opportunity for us to take climate action um, in our everyday lives so that we can all live within our planetary boundaries, as was mentioned um, earlier. So I really appreciate all the information that you've given us tonight. Um, so much to think about and so much. Uh, it's like a little trip into the future. Really, really fascinating. Um, and, and I love that you've given us some really great tips about how to incorporate some small changes into our lives as well. So Thank you. I'm definitely going to try and get some more seaweed into my life. And my challenge is going to be to something other than nori, maybe, Nick, I don't know, something. Um, 
Anyway, thank you. Thank you so much to our panellists, to Liza, to Nick and to Sam. We can't thank you enough for giving up your time um, to be talking with us tonight and sharing all of your fascinating work. We're grateful for you being with us and we're also really grateful for the amazing work that you all do. Um, thank you to all the participants, everyone who's come tonight. We're, we're really um, so grateful that you to have taken an interest in this topic and hope that you found it as interesting as, as I have. Um, thank you for the great questions and for engaging in these conversations about taking climate action. Um, we have on just a bit of a plug if there's any information that you want about Yara and ways of taking climate action um, the best way is to catch us are through our website um, and also through our monthly newsletter which you can sub subscribe through to through our website so I recommend that you go there and um, we also have information there about any sort of any future events um, that we've got coming up and speaking of future events just a bit of a plug so um Eliza mentioned earlier about one of those sort of actions um, or things that you can do is to eat more Indigenous plants and in Indigenous foods. And um, so thankfully we have an event coming up not uh, in about two weeks. It's on the 30th of March where you can learn more about eating more native plants. Um, and we have Norni Barrow, who's the head chef of Big Esso and owner of Mabu Mabu, an Indigenous-owned business. And she's going to be running a plant-based cook-along with us online, um, talking about native plants and how to incorporate more native plants into our um, into our diets. She's going to be cooking Hasselback yams, I believe, with crispy currants and, and some native herbs. It's going to be delicious. And it's an online cook-along, so we send you the ingredients beforehand and then she'll cook with you and you can do it with us um, from your kitchen. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and so I really encourage you to sign up for that. Um, and also, if you're interested in making your home uh, more energy efficient, we also have some great events coming up about solar for apartments and making townhouses um, and apartments more efficient and sustainable. So I recommend that you log on to our website to find out more about those things. Um, so that brings tonight's webinar to a close. If you have any family or friends um, that you think would have been interested in tonight's session but couldn't come along, it has been recorded and will be up on our website in the next couple of weeks. So um, please do recommend it to, to people who you think might be interested. Uh, and the last thing I'm going to ask is that in your inbox, we've sent you a two-minute very brief survey just to get your feedback about tonight's event. It really helps us to shape our events and to, um, and we find your feedback really valuable. So um, we'd appreciate that. And um, Sam mentioned some of those resources that um, and papers. Um, that's also in that email um, along with some other information about our upcoming events. So, um, so yes, thank you for coming along tonight and we hope that everybody has a really great evening. And thanks again to our presenters and to everyone for coming. Have a great night, everybody. Good night. Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Bye.